Without further ado, I'm going to introduce a gentleman who really needs no introduction, but Mr. Vern Stewart, who is also a claw virgin. Thank you. <laughs> Me, a virgin, isn't that something? Blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to apologize that we have no microphones, uh, so we'll try to get as good of, of audio as we can for this. So I'll try to enunciate, voice, voice. project. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, starting at the beginning, uh, we share a very interesting footnote in leather contest history. Would you please tell us? What was said at the 2004 Mr. Cellblock contest in Chicago? Well, there are a few of us here that were there that night, I see, out in the audience, whose mouths fell open uh, <laughs> that night, uh, mine being one of them. Uh, we had, it was the Mr. Cellblock contest, and um, I had been invited to be a judge along with um, who I believe is going to be the one of the MCs at IML this year, John Pendle. Um, and it was the step down of, um, I believe he lives in uh, Europe now, um, that particular contestant. Anyway, uh, you know, as, as a judge, you generally before your interviews are over, they'll ask you, producer or somebody, to um, write out a question, which can be asked later on during the contest. And we all did. And one of the questions, and unfortunately it had to be me who <laughs> wrote that question, I had said, you know, with Chicago being the first city that it is, um, and with so many uh, ethnic backgrounds there, um, and there weren't a lot of um, people of color that were entering IML contests and things like that, my question was, what could you do to bring more people of color uh, into the leather community and into IML. And this one contestant stood up there and said, when he was asked the question by Frank Nowicki, he said, well, guess I'll have to go to some colored bars and find them. Well, Frank is generally never speechless, but his mouth kind of fell open. <laughs> and he's standing there holding the microphone. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting next to John Pendle at the table. And John Pendle, I thought he was going to break my wrist. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? <laughs> yes, John, I heard what he said. <laughs> Outgoing title holder looked at me and said, "No, he didn't say that." <laughs> I turned around and looked back. There was Mufasa and a few other, quite a few other uh, Onyx members. <laughs> Their mouths just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say that. And, and I could hear. I screeching, Mary Elizabeth. Did you hear that? She was way in the back. <laughs> and you could hear her all the way. Out of the front. Frank, Frank finally pulled himself together and tried to compose himself. And he said, Oh, I see. Uh, which is my line generally. And um, nobody that this man was a contestant but they were all in the back so they didn't hear the answer 
But when they came out on stage, they just saw all the audience, and the audience was still up. <laughs> if they had said something wrong, did something wrong. And they found out later on. And it, that story, I think, has circled the globe. I've had people from Europe say, I understand you had a very interesting interview uh, at a contest in Chicago. It went around the world, and of course, I was going to ask the person once it was over, and I can't even remember his name now. I was going to ask the person, well, just where are these colored bars that I need to go to? <laughs> uh, but the last we saw of him was the heels of his shoes hitting the front door of uh, the cell block never to be seen or heard from again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so that was the, the story of, and, and they know, some of the people here, that I'm not making it up because they were there and heard it. You know? <laughs> so it's like, oh, some people just need to close their mouths and think before they open and ins insert a shoe. In mouth, um, it was it was something, and I don't think people have ever forgotten that. I see people now. Oh, yeah, I remember you. Oh, no, what me to say? I wrote the question. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's how that all went down, and and I didn't know. I couldn't remember who won. You know that contest. I mean, shit, I couldn't remember the next day, let alone that. But when he contacted me about doing this, he says, "You know, we've met." I said, "Oh, have we now?" And I said, "Yes. Um, I uh, I was at a particular contest one evening. <laughs> uh, I've been to forty, fifty, sixty contests or more." And he said it was in Chicago. It was at the cell block. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's another guy that I met here yesterday in that tent out there. And uh, he was taking pictures. And he said, oh, yes, uh, I remember you. I was doing photos for some publication or something. And he was down in the front. <sighs> And he said, when the guy gave his answer, he said his camera went up like this because he was standing on this platform. He says, I forgot to snap the picture. <laughs> 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 so, anyway, that's that. And I won that year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's where we're going. Yeah. As an admission, oh. yeah. He had a win, yeah. yeah. So as, as a joke, um, I, I, I got very sick a couple of months ago, so as a joke, Burns sent me an email and said, oh, did you have your operation at one of the colored hospitals? <laughs> 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 so we've got a lot of mm. mileage out of that. <laughs> but please tell us a little bit about growing up, a little about your family. Well, I'm a California kid, uh, West Coast. Um, my mother... Oddly enough, was born here. I can see why she fled. <laughs> uh, and um, out to California, uh, we went. I um, and I think during that era, World War II just was ending, and you know, FDR was doing his fireside chats and all of that. And she came, uh, they came out there to do a better life. And uh, my father was architect and uh, co a contractor. So he was um, looking for something, and he did find employment out there. And we moved to Berkeley. And Berkeley in those days was UC Berkeley is there, a college town, et cetera, et cetera, and all of that. 
uh, when I went to look for a house, they did uh, find a house on the upper side of Berkeley, the north side. There was a South Berkeley and uh, North Berkeley. North Berkeley is closer up to UC. Found a house there. They liked and set in to buy it. And um, they put the money down and blah, 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 and done all these things that you do when you're purchasing a house and, and all of that. Then they found out that um, they had what was known, and maybe some of you are not familiar with it, but towns had them, and then some towns still have them. Covenants, building covenants, living covenants. Um, and what it, a covenant was at that point, they didn't want any uh, people other than wasp, white, Anglo-Saxon. Protestants, you know, and um, it wasn't just no blacks or no this or no that. And of course, you must remember at that time, um, Japanese were in internment camps um, out near Livermore, California, Camp Parks, and all of that. So they weren't highly thought of either, you know. Um, and they were told that they could not. Uh, move into that neighborhood and of course my father was like what do you mean and um, well they had this covenant so they were the first people first family to take it to court and we're talking about 1945 46 and um, it went to court they got a uh, I think his boss my dad's boss turned them over to this, recommended a, uh, an attorney who thought it was outrageous. And of course, the attorney was of Jewish persuasion. So you know how they felt about all the business that had gone on across the pond. Um, and he said, I'm gonna take this. And he did, and of course he put his staff and everything to work, and um, they did. Um, they went to various houses and were asking and investigating what this, what, what do you think about that? And for the most part, the neighbors that were German on one side, and I don't know what the others were on the other side, but they asked all the people on our block, our side, what they thought. None of them had any problems with anybody people on the back block and two blocks away. They were complaining about it. You know, we never even knew anything about it. But anyway, we went to, they went to court. It was broken and um, it hit the newspapers and the Berkeley Gazette and the Oakland Tribune and all of that, that we were the first uh, black family that moved into that neighborhood. And we were the only black family in that neighborhood for probably eight or nine years, you know. But I, you know, I knew the kids there, and across the street was the Salvo Naval Project housing for guys that were in the Navy with their families and what have you. And so constantly going to school, grammar school there, you were always meeting new kids. Um, there weren't, oddly enough, any black kids that lived in that project. Well, as you know, there weren't uh, many blacks that were in the service. It wasn't until Harry Truman came along and said, oh, nay, nay, we got to change this, you know. But it's hard. So, so anyway, that's how I, that's where I grew up. I never had any problems. There was no such thing as, oh, um, no, they, they live there, and those people, and this, that, and the other. It was, there were people in the community that, um, California was very, it was a type of um, city where you had college, you had a lot of people there, but they didn't do anything open 
I mean, like in the South, uh, it was like, uh, nigga, this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. You didn't hear any of that there. They were much more sedate about that, you know. Step aside or look at you funny and things like that for some. But I never had that problem in grammar school. I never had it um, in junior high or anything like that. I didn't go through that. So it was kind of like reading about all of these things that were happening in the South. And, and I was like blown away that there were still segregated schools in um, Virginia in 1960. You know, and I, 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 I'm trying to deal with this in my head. Of course, we were, you know, just kind of like blown away that this was going on. Not denying that it wasn't going on, but it wasn't going on there in, in, in that area. Um, so I didn't really have any problems like that. I, some years later, I was uh, going through some... Uh, papers and dealing with some stuff for my mom and my grandmother. They had opened up and taken out a um, insurance policy. And in those days, your insurance man came to your house and collected. You didn't have all this email and sending this, that, and the other. And the insurance man would come. And I happened to be at Metropolitan Life some years later and looking through the files and the application that um, he had taken out and in the application to say, oh, they should be insured. Oh, these are a very, they're a very nice colored family. I read it. Nice colored family and they should not be denied, you know. Of course, you had another insurance company called Golden State and Golden State Insurance was black owned. And so they'd come to you, door, you paid your dollar ninety-five cents or whatever it was, you know, for for your insurance for that week. And they came weekly, just about a couple of them came monthly, but that one was weekly. <clears throat> and when he found out that um, my folks had another insurance with Metropolitan, which is basically a totally white insurance company, and it was fairly big, and it still is, I, I assume. Um, uh, he said, how did, you, how did you all get into that? How did they let you in? And, you know, so let us in, you know. But they didn't know what he had written down there. They, they ice colored family. <laughs> 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 So, and I, I showed that, I asked for a copy of it, and, and I showed it to my folks some years later. <laughs> I won't even repeat what my grandmother said. <laughs> <you know. laughs> but anyway, um, we, we, we grew up there, went to school there. Um, uh, UC Berkeley was, of course, a well-known school, but it was always known as a there was always problems there. Crazy people went to UC Berkeley. And they were, you know, I mean, during the years coming up, they, um, they had the free speech movement. Um, young, younger guys here probably are not even aware of that, but it was a school that always had something going on there, you know, free speech movement, you had, um, Mario Savio, um, Tina Abdecker, um, uh, you name it, um, they were there. And um, that's how I kind of like got involved with it because you were around it. And they lived, I mean, they didn't live in um, fancy neighborhoods. Berkeley was a pretty general um, neighborhood. so. You always saw and heard these things, and the Berkeley Gazette and the college paper always had all of this information in there, and things were going on, and, and this, that, and the other. And of course, you had a, a governor, governor who governed Goodwin J. Knight, Goody Knight. Mm -hmm. yeah, he was 
he didn't know what to do. You had Clark Kerr, who was the president of UC Berkeley. He was trying to uh, deal with things that were um, to keep everybody happy. Well, you couldn't keep everybody happy. And, of course, you had um, Catherine Hurst of the Hurst dynasty, um, William Randolph's uh, and all of that. She sat on the Board of Regents, and, of course, she didn't really um, want to be bothered with any colored issues. But we'd moved from colored to Negro at that point. We'd stepped up, you know. So, um, that, that there were those things that brought all of that along. And of course, when the free speech movement started, they just were horrified. Uh, you know, we've got to get rid of these people. We, we, we can't have this. It's, it's blemishing the name of the University of California, blah, 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 this, that, and the other. And of course, while all that was going on, then you had Huey Newton, who suddenly jumped into the fray from the Deep South, and his family had moved to Oakland, <clears throat> and Huey Newton was just, um, he was a nice person as I got to know him later on, but he started out, I mean, like he even said, he um, financed his education by robbing people up in the Berkeley Hills in Oakland and Piedmont and this, that, and the other. He was he, he did that. Uh, and he didn't mind telling somebody that, you know. I met him, Stokely Carmichael. All those things were going along at that time. They were at Merritt College. And, you know, in between the police chasing them and beating them and shooting at them and um, arresting them, of course, uh, as you well know, if any of you are familiar with history, how that all played out. Uh, along came um, Angela Davis. We all remember Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. And she had bought some guns. Um, and they had uh, some things going on. They had arrested some of the people. Uh, some of them had been sent to San Quentin, which is just across the bay up there in Marin County. And um, they escaped, and uh, Judge Haley was shot in his courtroom up there in the Marin County Courthouse. And oh, it was living in Oakland, Berkeley at that time, and being a black person or a person of color was hell at times because the Oakland police were like. You'd have thought they were Nazis, you know. They stopped you for anything, bat your eyes wrong. Uh, you were pulled over. I had that happen to me any number of times, you know. And God forbid if you had a decent looking car and there was a white person in there, what you doing? What you doing in this neighborhood? Blah, 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 blah. Just to harass you. And, 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 and harassment got uh, really very big. There was a time, though, that. Um, uh, one of one or two of the um, free speech movement people decided to run for mayor. One even ran for governor. And of course, Angela Davis was on the Communist Party, and she ran. Hmm. And of course, uh, good old Ronnie Reagan was the governor. And he, oh no, no, he, we we can't have that. He did everything he could to make sure that she was removed from the staff of the University of California, um, Santa Cruz, yes, where she was teaching at that point. He, he put that into effect so she could not get a job uh, and, and things like that. So, I mean, there was that era. The 60s was like something. But I, you know. Sur survived it, and um, and it was a learning experience meeting and knowing these people, and they were pretty down to earth people. I never saw the parts of them, the gunfire and shootings and all of that. We'd certainly read about and see it in the news and everything else, but um, most of that happened in West Oakland, 
Well, homie didn't go to West Oak. So, you know, it was kind of like, you know, um, okay, you folks are over there. We stayed in our side of town, and I, and of course my parents would not have had me involved in any of that. Although I did go to uh, demonstrations. Uh, I, when I thought it was something that I believed in and it was wrong in the way of especially uh, police treatment and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I was, I was active in that and only hoping as I'd look around make sure Channel 4 or Channel 7 wasn't there with a the camera so that, and if they were there with a the camera, I could duck and pull my cap down over my head because I didn't want to hear my folks say, Nigga, please, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so um, it was like I learned, I grew from that. Um, and um, it was a learning experience which I will never regret at all, you know. But it was part of the 60s, the terrible 60s. You know, they said they were the sexy 60s. No, there wasn't much sexy about that. Um, and of course, needless to say, it was going on there. I think California received more coverage than a lot of other places. In the South, you heard coverage about somebody being uh, maybe strung up to a tree or drugged down a tree or beaten, but you didn't hear much about um, any equal rights and civil rights thing until Martin Luther King came along. Then uh, people started becoming involved in California, UC Berkeley. They had folks that went down there during the voter registration time. And, and I remember my, my mother saying, you don't need to go down there uh, because they're killing people, this, that, and the other, and, and all of that. I did go once. You had to go in a group. If you went across the street to the store, you went as a group with somebody looking over your shoulder. You marched back over to your motel where you were staying or whatever. It was, it was something because those days, they would think nothing of pulling a gun and blowing you away right in the middle of the street. Um, and it was, it, was, it was scary. It was, really was scary. But, you know, when you're young, and you, you know, you full of piss and vinegar. And, oh, fuck those people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you gotta go. You uh -huh. know, uh, I was lucky. A couple of guys weren't as lucky. Um, and it taught it taught me a lesson about how much uh, hatred there really was, you know, um, in in the world and in those areas. So from that, you know, I mean, that was one portion of my life. And, and of course, at one point, we moved out to Hayward, California, which is southern Alameda County. And nice little neighborhood and everything. Little did I know that there was uh, one of the guys, uh, Sonny Barger, Sonny Barger, was the president of Hell's Angels. We all heard about Hell's Angels. And that's when I kind of, and he wasn't that type of a person, at least not to the neighbors. Everybody liked him, and he was okay. Had a lot of women and lots of wives and bikes and this and that. And that's when I saw all the leather business. And, oh. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they had their leather jackets and this, that, and the other, and tattoos and all of that. And I got to talking to them. And um, there was a couple of bars in San Leandro, Oakland, and Hayward that um, they hung out. Yeah. Well, knowing him, I went to a couple of the bars, walked in there, and then, Big the beard hanging down and the hair hanging down, this, that, and the other. And 
And I talked to him, and you know, I was like, oh, this little kid over here, you know, he, he wants to get involved in all of that. And when I bought a motorcycle, the first one, I thought my mother was going to absolutely <laughs> drop me. <laughs> I thought she was going to fall over and die. Um, because I didn't even tell her I bought it, I kept it at somebody else's house. Um, would dare bring it home, you know. And, um, and of course, black families, I don't care how grown you are, your grandparents, your mother, your father, they're going to talk about beating your black ass all up and down the street and don't be embarrassing us, you know. And, and so, you know, it's like, mm hmm. So, I tell my grandmother, boy, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you, what, what you, what them white folks? And I said, no, I just want to know. And I, and I, when I got to Biden, finally, they saw it for the first time. I remember. My, and in those days, they didn't have, the law hadn't been passed about the helmets back then. So you didn't have to have one, but my mother said, well, if this fool child is going to be on a motorcycle, well, let me buy him a, har a, a helmet so that at least we'll be able to recognize the body by his facial structure <laughs> when, he, when his ass gets run over by something. <laughs> yeah, you know, so she was, she, she was keen on that, you know, I want to be able to recognize you. But the rest of you scattered all of the you know, So um, I got involved with that. Then, of course, after after those clubs uh, that I had attended, then I stepped on across the bridge to uh, San Francisco. Well, I didn't know at first that there was, you know, the straight clubs. I saw bikes, uh, motorcycles parked out in front. There was this bar called The Tool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, tools, oh. Bikes sitting out there in front. And I stepped on in. I was not a kid that was afraid to go. I was nosy. I always wanted to find out, well, what is this? You know, what's this all about? You know? And I went into the Tool bar and, and, um, uh, it was on Folsom and Fifth, I believe. Anyway, I'm, I walked in, there were guys with their chaps on and their leather pants and this, that, the other. Huh? Ordered a drink. Nobody said anything to me about what you doing in here or anything like that. And I stood there and listened to various conversations. And I didn't know what I expected that they were going to be talking about, but what I didn't expect was that they were going to be talking about, oh, so-and-so is at the opera house this weekend. <laughs> and such and such. Uh, uh, and did you see Julia and that wonderful recipe she did about quiche? And I thought, no. And, and come to find out when I was in there, Closing hours to o'clock in San Francisco, California, for the bars. But I'd go outside, and I'd see these people getting on their bikes. But the rest of them in all this leather, taxi, taxi. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, not all these people have bikes. They're just coming down there and dressing the part. And that was the case, you know. And, and that when I started talking to people, I knew I met some very nice people. And the surprising part about it was, they might have had leather on at night, but they were in their Brooks Brothers during the daytime down in uh, on Montgomery Street, which is the financial district of San Francisco. And they lived pretty normal lives. No, they didn't live in hovels. They had very nice apartments, very nice homes. Lovely artwork and all of that. I was going, oh my God, oh, this is something, you know. So I, that's kind of like how when I met people and, and got involved with all of this, it was, that was it. Well, IML 
is coming up again, and you attended the first IML. Mm -hmm. Please tell us a bit about that. IML, the first IML was 1979. I was just a mere child. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, the reason that um, I wound up going, really, was in those days, IML was not this uh, Memorial Day weekend. Oh, no, no, no. It was always Mother's Day weekend. And my folks had since moved to Chicago. So, got to go see Mama on Mama's Day, you know, on Mother's Day weekend. And that's when I found out about uh, this leather. I knew about, I knew about the Gold Coast. Um, and I knew about several other bars there. So I went, and of course, they were putting together um, this contest. And if you read, if any of you have read Chuck Renslow's latest book, the one that came out last year, um, he tells you pretty much the way it was those first, the first couple of years. Uh, and, and they held the first contest at um, the Radisson, which was down around, not too far from uh, Gold Coast, which was on Clark Street uh, then. And, uh, and of course, there was another bar right across the street, on the side, not on Clark, but on the side street, which was owned by um, um, uh, it was the Redoubt, and um, the guy that owned it also owned Baton, the Baton, um, and. They kind of had a, between Chuck and, um, God, what's, um, Jim Flint. Jim Flint? Felicia Flint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Felicia Flint. Yeah. Yeah, so Felicia Flint had, had a bar and she had the, 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 the uh, baton and this and that and all that stuff. So they were kind of in, you know, um, running against each other and all of that. And, and his bar was kind of nice. And uh, we used to run back and forth across the street to the, the other one and all that. And Jim Flint was doing very well with the baton. It became one of those bars kind of like there was a place in San Francisco called Finocchio's where the drag queens and all uh, that went. And it became one of these places where the tour buses pulled up there and you got and then all the straight folks got out and marched in and from from uh, Iowa and Wyoming and all these places to see these men in women's clothing you know and so he was doing quite well with that plus Jim Flint was also very big into the sports and athletics he had he sponsored a number of um, softball teams and this that and everything he was big into that so we had those things. So between the two bars and Clark Street along that area had oh, a couple of the bookstores and this, that, and the other. All that was going on. So you'd see people you know, stepping on off into the bookstores, you know, the reading rooms, or as, as several folks used to call, and Marcus included, the library. Oh, I'm on my way to the library. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> mm, read this. <laughs> so um, it was. It was kind of like, okay. Pat, Pat Bat, Patrick Bat, who's a very good friend of mine, lives in California now. He was his first um, manager, and if you looked in that book. You saw pictures of Pat at the um, Gold Coast and what have you, and all of that. And he and a couple of others said, we ought to do something about having a leather contest, and other than just a Mr. Chicago leather. And let's open it up to other cities, other states, all that kind of stuff. And um, they did, and the first year, Oh, there was, a f I think there were three or four from San Francisco that, uh, besides 
um, uh, besides the winner. And a few here, I think there's maybe a total of, I'm not even sure if there was 20, 20 people, I don't think there were. Uh, I think it was like maybe 10 or 12 people or something or another in local that entered that contest, you know. Uh, and it went over kind of well because it was something new and it gave people something to go to and to look forward to doing. And they could dress up in all their finery, you see. And I mean, that became a, that was known as a high cow event, you know. That wasn't a low move, that was high cow. You know? and, uh, and so, you, you folks, and leather stores were starting to open up. Uh, there was a, the, was it nail hide leather in Chicago? And he said, oh, well, let's get in on this. Yeah, let's get some cow hide here and dress these boys up. So <coughs> they had that, and there were several others, and people were getting involved in it. So it became a thing. Well, once um, David uh, Hoff um, um, became uh, IML and back to San Francisco, well, he pushed a lot of the people. Ooh. And the bar that he was connected with, which was called the Arena, and in those days, he worked there and, and, and folks started coming in and they didn't know exactly what to buy. But, well, child, you know, first of all, you know, get yourself a coat. You know, you need a coat in San Francisco weather, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then get yourself a pair of boots. You don't have to worry about all this vests and this and that and da 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 da. Because in those days, compared to now, leather was inexpensive compared to, but it was still hot because we weren't making that much money, you know? And, and so you had to pick and choose. So you got your boots and you got your jacket. Well, hell, you could get away with wearing some Levi's, you know, black Levi's, and two jackets. That was cool. He pushed it. And uh, the next year, a few more people came out of curiosity, not because they were going to enter the contest, but they wanted to see, well, oh, there's some others look like us. Oh, okay. And they came. And those two, those first two years, um, it, was, it was a kind of a family thing. You knew all the bartenders at the Gold Coast and, and they were very friendly, you had a good time, but you um, connected with people, uh, people in Chicago and a few other places that they had come from. And that's kind of like how it really got started uh, in, in Chicago for, for people there. Um, I, I know that Chuck had many times been, said, well, why don't you have it and such and such, and why don't you move it around? He said, no, it's going to stay right here. And stay right there it did, and that's where it still is and will always be. You know, it's not, he, he said it would have been too much of a hassle to try to move a contest of this or that. And we've seen how that's gone with ABW, you know. I mean, like, oh, yeah, they moved it from when I started with it and it was one of the producers and all that, Able Productions, we did it in Washington, D.C. It seemed to be a perfect time of year. Uh, it, the weather was decent and everything else. Now, of course, the first two years that we did it, it was in uh, Boston. I was with Mike uh, up there in Boston to get the thing started. Then it moved down to D.C. Well, after all that, they, they, they thought, okay, um, you had that there. Then when it was sold, we turned it over. Uh, uh, Dean Ogren decided to move it to, of all places, New Orleans. Now, what person in your right mind do you know that's going to pack a suitcase full of leather in the middle of July and go to New Orleans. Hello? You know, um, it was hot 
and it's sticky, and 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 it was horrible, and and they've tried that. They tried it with international leather serve back when it was drummer. It was always held in San Francisco. That's where that's where um, Tony De Blas was. That's where um, the the owner of publisher of drummer way back when. It's always been there. The magazine was there. So it made good sense to have that. Plus, they had the advertising of the magazine. And in those days, you know, everybody was buying Drummer. You know, it was the magazine. Um, and, and so it's never been, it's never changed. And let's face it, uh, Renslow hasn't gone to the poorhouse behind having it at uh, IML. I mean, you know, he hasn't had to pick up any uh, food stamps to survive, you know. You know I'll tell you that, you know. So um, he's done well, and um, it's it seems to be okay, but it's changed over the years. It has changed drastically. Uh, and I can't say that I'm all that pleased with the direction that it is taken. Uh, it's become more of a social gathering and uh, um, and oh and for a while there it was almost a, seemed like oh let's go there and get high and, and, and it lost its initial reason for being. You look at the guys from 79, 80, 81 and all the people that were IML um, people respected them and they said this is my representative as the years have gone on it's kind of like you know a whole hum um, and that's not to say that everybody hasn't had some kind of agenda but it's kind of gone down it uh, certain years it's almost seemed like it's a costume party um, you know oh you know, oh well no you have this confused with Halloween. No, 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 no. This, is not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Um, but I think, you know, they're trying, and I would like to try to make sure that the guys that are entering these contests now know something about the contest, know something about the history. Why are you up here? You know, are you just standing here? at the s and standard model and with your little um, uh, sash across and what have you because it developed into that for a few years and it was like oh oh her mm -hmm. yeah well it's like I hope that it's going back to you know the way it kind of initially was and I, I in my heart of hearts I do believe that Rinslow won't say anything now but I know he like to see it the way it started, I believe, you know, and, and continue in that uh, um, area. Um, well, in, in coming full circle, you judged IML last year. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on <laughs> judging? Well, <laughs> I. <laughs> I will say this, you know, having gone to all these IMLs, 32 of them, whatever, I have watched and I have dealt with um, these and observing. I used to love to go and, and just sit back and watch between, between my older sister, Marcus, uh, and I, we, used sit, we used to sit there and we... We had them down, and I usually had it down to who the top ten were, and, and, and narrowed down sometimes even more so than that. Certain years, you knew who IML was going to be, just by the way he behaved, by the way he acted, by the way things went. Um, but what has happened is that people are taking it more as just, oh, I just wanted to end it for fun. Well, I don't want international Mr. Fun leather. I, you know, I, he's representing me. Well, then I want to see something more than fun, you know. Uh, and, and I think that um, it's why it's so important to me that people know 
their history or something about it. And I'll tell you, last year, I was never so disappointed with so many of the class of 2012 that could not even name three former IMLs. And five or six of them were right there at IML last year. Well, what does that tell me? What does that say to me? Well, okay, you don't even know the person that was the year before you or two years before, or you don't have anybody that maybe might have been a role model in IML? Well, then why did you bother to enter? What's, what's, what's going on here, you know? Um, and, and when I saw that last year, and people, and, and one said, oh, well, I'm just so bad with memories, I just can't remember. <laughs> oh. Well, Missy, then you need to be uh, sitting at home somewhere reading a book rather than representing the entire um, leather community. And you're not just representing the men, you got the leather women also. We can't forget them. They came along. They came along a little bit um, later. But I mean, from Judy Tallwing McCarthy on up, you know, um, they've put their two cents worth in. And not to have, not to say that they haven't had problems and what have you, but they're still doing it. You know, it started a little bit later, uh, eighty-seven as opposed to seventy-nine, but you know they're doing okay. I just, I was disappointed last year with the lack of knowledge that so many of the um, contestants had. Uh, there was one that came that who he had an IML from his area. He didn't even know. I mentioned his name, asked him, he said, who? Oh no, he didn't know nothing about the man. And he was the only IML from that particular country ever. You think, okay, then what are the reasons that you really want to enter this contest? Because your friend said, oh, that's a cute little outfit over there. Get that. You'll look good in that. I don't want international Mr. Cute Little Outfit uh, representing me. I want somebody that's got something up here that can lead us, speak up when necessary, um, and even when not necessary, uh, and, and support uh, the leather community, be it black, be it white. Uh, I, I have certainly said over the years that we've only had two people of color. The first one, Ron Moore, was real. Worked for a phone company when he wasn't climbing poles, and he was as funny as the day was long. Called me on a Sunday and, what you doing? He said, well, I just put my hair up and curl it. I got on my fuzzy slippers. <laughs> and, and he was, he was, but he was real. And they mistreated him as when he was IML. They, they didn't do the same for him as they did for white IMLs. Some of them. Uh, they used to have a, they used to have a um, company in LA that always took the current IML and used him as a model for their chaps. And that company was the first company that started making chaps with um, the zipper on the outside. Every year, IML on it. When it came time of the year for him, mm -mm, never saw a picture of him at all. You know, little crap like that. Went to San Francisco. San Francisco was always your first exposure to uh, your IML community, you know, for the con uh, for the uh, parade in June. Well, the year that he won, they decided um, the float, the owner of the bar. Oh well, no, we're only going to have our runner up, who was a runner up that year, at I'm on the float. Mm -hmm. Always had been IML and. If there was someone else, they always rode and waved and what have you. Didn't happen. 
I was fit to be tied. I went off. Um, as it so happened, uh, the gentleman that owned a bar called Chaps in San Francisco, Chuck Slayton, he had just bought a brand new bus, a uh, um, brand new truck, and um, his other half, who was a San Francisco police officer, had a beautiful black Harley. He put that Harley in the back of the truck and put Ron Moore on there, and his black ass was seen going up and down. <laughs> and I mean, it was like gorgeous, yes. and he got all, you know, it, it's crap like that that we still have to work on. We still have to work on the the um, problems of uh, segregation and this, that, and the other. And there's some of it in the leather community. Oh yes, there is. You know, they may cover it over a little bit, but it's there. You know, uh, it's not as obvious as it used to be way back when. That's why I've been always a big pusher when they, when uh, Mufasa and all those started um, Onyx, you know, uh, maybe, you know, that would bring more people to the forefront and, uh, and get them in. It hasn't been what I would hope that it would be. Uh, I'm not sure that it hasn't been spread out enough rather than people thinking, oh, well, you have to be part of Onyx in order to enter the contest. No, you don't have to. As, which is the case this year, you know, part of Onyx. Um, and I, I would like to see more people of color, Asians. We've, how many Asians have they had in at IML? Like three, you know. Uh, uh, one of them was from, he wasn't even from here, he was from Canada, you know. Uh, but he did well, you know, and they've had a couple in L.A., from L.A., and this, that, and the other, things like that. Um, so we'll see. There will be one this year. And I think that's great. Bird Stewart, thank you very much.